one of the things that God has been saying to me all week is we need to make sure that our private confession matches our public declaration. I see a lot of people out there in public settings proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming who we are in Christ, proclaiming God's grace, but when in private they are judgmental, criticizing, bringing people down, and condemning. And that's not God's heart. You know, God wants us to be who we are in public and in private. And I love the message of identity and nature, and that's something that we talk about all the time. I think it's extremely important because a lot of the problems that Christians face today is a lack of understanding of who they are in Christ. But the reason some are not getting it is because there is no teaching on what it really means. You could tell someone that they have the grace and the empowerment to overcome sin till you're blue in the face, but they're still struggling with sin. They're still struggling because there's no teaching going on. There's just preaching. There's just pretty phrases that sound good. Oh, that's so poetic. Kind of touches our hearts. And I mean, I love that. Sometimes I'm running and I get the most inspired phrases ever. And we could post that th those on Facebook. We could, you know, share them. We can write books about them. But those, you know, and the Holy Spirit can move and can touch lives. But really teaching what it means sometimes is really what makes a difference. Truth is what brings deliverance. Truth. When we have a stronghold in our lives, and a stronghold can be a thought process, um, it could be a belief that we have that may not be of God. When we drop those and we lose those and we learn what the Holy Spirit has, that is the permanent deliverance because I've had that happen to me and it's something that it can't come back. It's not a demon that I can give access to again. It's a thought process. So I know that our heart's desire is to be set free and to, to know Jesus more and to know who he is and to look more and more like him. So that's what I wanted to dive into today because what does it mean to look like Jesus? What does it mean to have an identity where you are the son of God? What does that look like in our daily lives? So um, today we're going to read quite a bit. So I don't know if everyone here has a Bible, but if you have one on your phone or, or whatnot and you can um, help us with reading, that would be great. There are passages that I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation after someone reads it in, a, in one of the more traditional versions, only because I, the, some of the verses the Passion Translation is so in our language, I think the message, I won't even need to teach on it. It will be so clear. That's all that needs to be said. The Word of God will teach in itself. So first we're going to start with um, Galatians 5.22 which is um, the passage, that's where uh, we learn about the fruit of the Spirit. So we will, um, whoever would like to read that, if you can just prep that and hold it for a second. So Galatians 5.22. And I don't know if you guys ever thought of this, but I heard somebody say this and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. It's called the fruit of the spirit, not the vegetable of the spirit, right? <laughs> so um, I was like, okay, why, why is it why is it the fruit of the spirit? So I started learning, reading about fruit. What is fruit? What does it mean from a you know a natural context, and then what does it mean from a supernatural context, spiritually speaking? So one of the things that I learned was that fruit is comes from a seed it's considered the it's seed that comes from the ovary of the plant okay so that's what fruit is it's a seed 
and we're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about seeds as kind of builds, but the fruit, all fruit comes from seed. Vegetables do not. Vegetables are the plant. So that's how you differentiate a fruit from a vegetable. We are seeds of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave birth to us. Because of him, we have access to the Father and we multiply. So I thought that was interesting. There's a definition that says a fruit, you know, like a natural fruit, is what is produced by the inherent energy of a living organism. And then metaphorically speaking, when we hear about we have the fruit of the spirit, we need to bear fruit, things like that. It's works being the visible expression of power, working inwardly and invisibly, the character of the fruit being evidence of the character of the power producing it. So, when, you, when we are, as believers, to bear fruit, we are to bear fruit that looks like Jesus. Because we come from God. We come from Jesus. If our fruit doesn't look like Jesus... It's bad fruit. So let's expound on that. So can someone read Galatians 5, 22 and 23? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So that's very clear, right? I could, we could do a whole study on itself of each fruit of the spirit. But um, there is one that I want to point out, and that's the first one that it speaks of, which is love. When we see the fruit of the spirit, this is something I've learned since I was a little girl. It's not fruits of the spirit. It's fruit of the spirit. Now, growing up, one of the things that in my head I was, was like, we're supposed to have them all. It's not, oh, I'm going to pick you know, I'm going to pick kindness, but, you know, my uh, self-control is going to laugh. No, we should, we should have it all. It's one fruit, right? But there's also a frame of thought that in the Greek, it actually is the fruit of the spirit is love and, and then it, and then joy, peace, kindness, goodness follows it, describing what it looks like in love. Either way, these are all traits that as fruit of Jesus, we are to have. So right now I'm not talking about the fruit that we are to bring forth. I'm talking about the fruit we are to be. Jesus' house, we are be, love, go. Before we go, we must be. Before our public declaration comes out, we need to make sure our private confession is in the right place. Because we want to make sure that we're producing good fruit. So we need to be good fruit. And th these are some characteristics of what being good fruit look like. But much like there is good fruit, we also have what I would say is bad fruit. And what this passage refers to it as is um, uh, works. Works of the flesh. So one of the things that I did want to um, touch on today when we talk about works of the flesh is what flesh really is. So good news, our flesh, our bodies are not evil. They are important. God tells us to, we are to take care of our bodies. They are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If our bodies were horrible, he wouldn't tell us to take care of it. He'd tell us to throw it away. But that's not what he says. Flesh, even in the natural, okay? Now, I want you to think about our bodies, and I want you to think about fruit and even, you know, some vegetables, things like that. Flesh is the softer or weaker element of the nature. So in this case, let's look at our bodies. What is our flesh? It's our, it's our meat. It's our muscle, right? It's not our entire being. And in the New Testament, that's what Paul is referring to. 
It's the weaker part of us. It doesn't mean our flesh, our bodies. It doesn't mean flesh, our soul. That's not what it's saying. It's saying the weaker part of us in general, meaning body and soul and spirit. There's a, a below the sword. Okay. There's evil that can happen. It's the weaker part. So we need to make sure that we know that because that weaker part is what we need to drown down, bring down, and we need to lift up those things which are of God, those fruit of the spirit, and get rid of the weaker parts of us. So um, let's go through what some of those works of the flesh is. Um, this is one where I'll have somebody read. It's right before it. So Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And then I'll read it in the Passion. So um, if someone can read it, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, Which I have a lewdness, lewdness. Oh, okay, yeah, lewdness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such the like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. So I'm going to read it in the Passion because people hear those things and they sound like, whoa, such far off things, like none of us, you know, when none of us do any of that, right? So this was a real eye-opener when I heard this is kind of like in our context today, in our in our society today, what, what would those things, what would we call them? The cravings of the self-life are. Now, when we talk about flesh, the other thing that I would point out is that when we refer to flesh in, in, in looking at what I've studied, it really is your life without God. It's a selfish life. And here I like the way they say it because they say your self-life. Meaning your life without God, when you have a life, even if it's a portion of your life without God, these are the types of things that we may find ourselves in. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behaviors. So, you know, a lot of times we hear these, you know, dissensions and factions, and it sounds like such a, oh, I don't, I don't do any of those things, right? But listening to it in the context of our culture today, there are some of these things that we may find that we actually find ourselves in, sometimes more often than, than we, we should. For example, strife, you know, causing a problem between two people or being envious because someone seems to be favored or someone's blessing someone quicker. Like I've been at this for four years and look at that person. They just came to Jesus two months ago and, and look at them. And we may not verbalize it, guys, but sometimes it's happening in here and it's happening here. And those are not good fruit at all. And we can hide it. And we can publicly declare what we know the Bible says we should do. But if in our hearts these things are happening, those seeds are there. The fruit is there. There is good fruit. 
and there is bad fruit. But there's good news because I believe, and the Bible says, that Jesus came and gave us grace. And grace is the empowerment to overcome all of these things. So in Galatians 5.13, I'll read my version, um, but if you have a more traditional one that you like, you can read along. <laughs> Beloved ones, God has called us to, a, to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. Mm -hmm. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all we do. For love completes the laws of God. All of the law can be summarized in one grand statement. Demonstrate love to your neighbor, even as you care for and love yourself. So even in the freedom that we have in the Holy Spirit, we need to make sure that we're not using that to operate in the works of the flesh and masquerade it. I've heard people, you know, you know, because they say, oh, I'm, I'm saying this out of love or, you know, not, not whenever someone starts a sentence with no offense, but like, mm. yeah, th there's offense there, like, or else you wouldn't say that, but, <laughs> but we need to, the Bible talks over and over again about how, about gentleness, about kindness. You know, kindness is what leads people into repentance. And we need to make sure that when we're speaking, when we're ministering, when we're living our lives, that we're living in accordance to the fruit of the Spirit and not the fruit of selfishness mm -hmm. that stems from selfishness. So, can someone read um, verses 16 and 18 in the same chapter? I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You can read the next one. Till 18. Oh, 17. Oh, you would, oh, okay. You said yeah, 16. she said 16 oh. and 18. She meant 16. Oh, six, 17 and 18. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Right. So some people will see this passage about how the flesh and the Spirit fight each other, it's almost used as an excuse in the body of Christ today. You know, even when people refer to Romans 7, oh, I'm just like Paul. Um, no, you are not like Paul because that was Paul's self before he came to Christ. If you read in context, Paul was a new creation, no longer had to fight. He constantly talks about how we overcome how those who are led by the Spirit live by the Spirit. You can't please the Spirit and please your flesh at the same time. It is not possible. And here it says that, um, in this one says, as you yield freely and fully. That word freely is powerful because I can't force anybody to yield to the Holy Spirit. I can come here and bang you over the head with the Bible. I could tell you how, you know, how much sin is in your life. I could tell you how you're going to go to hell if you, you keep sinning. But that's not going to change your life. It really isn't. What's going to change your life is when you freely, you as an individual or someone else that we're ministering to, they freely and fully to the dynamic... Uh, they yield fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Those cravings go away. Much like, you know, I've we haven't been eating sugar for quite a while. I say a lot of my cravings have gone away, and that's in the natural. But I'm, 
I can tell you that the cravings of this world do go away. And I say that because I'm experiencing it. And a lot of people in this room are experiencing, a lot of people that we know that we fellowship with are experiencing it. It's just not as appetizing as it once was before. As a matter of fact, we probably associate it to a lot of bad feelings and a lot of bad consequences that came from living that life. If you, <laughs> if you, um, if you're a Christian and your life is boring, you're doing it wrong. Hmm. <laughs> End of story. No argument with me. I, I'll just follow us for a couple weeks and you'll see how it's so not boring. Okay. You need vacation sometimes just <laughs> because it's not boring. Um, and if you think it's boring, you're probably around the wrong people. If you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're afraid to take that step cause you're like, Oh, I don't want to give up. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. give up all the drinking. And when I say drinking, I mean drunk getting drunk. I don't want to give up, you know, my whatever short skirts. I don't want to give up, you know, sex. I don't want to give up all this stuff. And you're like, because then I'm going to be like that person or I'm going to be like those people in my church. You know, they're just with their ties and you know, all this stuff. Like you're around the wrong people. If, if you're seeing a, a boredom in Christianity, you're around the wrong people. So seek and ask the Holy Spirit, what's the truth about you? Because it is not boring. I mean, was Paul's life boring? No, it was difficult, but it was not boring. That's one for sure. All right. So now let's move on. So we've talked about the fruit. But it was difficult. But even in that, he was full of joy. If you read it, if you read what he wrote, it was clearly full of joy. I think a lot of us here, if we were in his situation, we'd be like, poor me, poor me. Instead, he was like, I'm the, <laughs> whatever. He's funny. Paul's funny, dude. Okay, so let's go to 2 Corinthians 1. So we just went over the gifts, and in... Uh, what did I say, Corinthians? I'm sorry, Peter. Second Peter. My mind is like all over the place. Second Peter 1. So we just talked about gifts and uh, the fruit. Mm -hmm. And in that, we see some character traits, right? Character mm -hmm. is extremely important, or integrity, whatever you want to call it. But who we are is important. And here, we read about ac some attributes that actually go align very well uh, well with the fruit. So, can someone read 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4? By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. So did you hear that divine nature? Here it says, we, I think it says something like we partner with his divine and nature. And you ask mode. One. <laughs> We partner with his divine nature. How many times do we hear that our, that our nature is sinful? We were born into a mm -hmm. sinful nature. When you are born again, and this message is real, this teaching is really for born again believers, right? Because if you don't have Jesus in your life, you're not going to be able to overcome the works of the flesh. That, that craving, right? You need to overcome that craving. You need the spirit, but we have partnered. We are able to partner with divine nature. And here I like it in, in verse three, it starts off by saying everything we could ever need for a life, for life and godliness has already been deposited in us through a divine power. So what we need to overcome as believers is already in us. 
The problem is, are we tapping into that or are we allowing that piece of our, that piece of ourselves that is weaker to be stronger? Where are we, where are we working out? What muscles are we working out? So then um, verses 5 through 11, who can read that? Now for this very reason also, apply in all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love. Which one did you say? Yeah, that's good, I think. I had through 11, so you can keep reading. Oh, all the way through 11? Mm-hmm. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the internal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. <clears throat> I mean, isn't that awesome? Just some things to point out. If we have these, we will never be fruitless. These are required to be fruitful. These guarantee our fruitfulness. The other thing is... Here, I'll read in, in, in this version. But if anyone lacks these things, he is blind, constantly closing his eyes to the mysteries of our faith and forgetting his innocence, for his past sins have been washed away. When we do not practice these things, do not think about these things, do not work on these things, we are forgetting who we really are, that we are washed, that we are clean. We are not worthless, dirty people. God loved us so much. He found us so worthy that he sent his only son to come to earth and to go through everything that he went through. To put on this human suit and suffer as he suffered just so that we can, he can find us back with him. Just so that we can be reconciled back to him so I, I just want to so in addition to faith right basically in the beginning of what he read it says to faith let's add so faith is the foundation right faith add goodness to goodness add knowledge to knowledge add self-control to self-control add endurance to endurance add godliness to godliness kindness and to kindness love Notice how similar to the fruit of the Spirit these attributes are. And I like how the fruit of the Spirit starts with love and this one ends with love. And in all of them, if you look, love encapsulates all of these things. Now just a thought. Is there selfishness in love? Is there any love in selfishness? They're like enemies. I know we always talk about how, you know, because because the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear, we kind of use that as it's the antithesis, right? It's the enemy of love. But selfishness, even in relationships, I want you to think about, it's something that God smacks me in the face in a nice way. <laughs> but a lot of times when I'm getting frustrated or impatient with something, the root is always selfishness. I cannot think of any situation where I've gotten frustrated, where I've gotten impatient, where I've been wanting to get unkind, where I had an attitude, even, even things like stealing and killing and, and all. If you think about all those things, they're all rooted in selfishness. They're all rooted in the lesser of us. Right? So in everything we have to ask, okay, if anything you guys take from these two, between the fruit and these, uh, these virtues here, is always remember love. 
Because love sums it up. You will find patience in love. You will find self-control in love. You will find kindness in love. You will find goodness. All of those things are find, found in love. And when you find yourself, there are times where we're going to have a, for lack of a better term, like an attitude where we kind of know it's wrong. We're like, man, why am I feeling this? I shouldn't be feeling this. Just ask yourself, where is this? Why, why, am I, why am I so upset at this person? And if you're honest with yourself, you have to back it up and find out, is this a selfish motive? And if it's a not selfish motive, then we need to learn how to have control, self-control, and we need to take it to God in prayer and ask God, how do I deal with this situation? Because this is really not about me. It's about love, right? So sometimes we find ourselves in that situation and we just have to make sure that we are um, living the good fruit. We're being the good fruit. All right, so now that we've talked about love, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. And um, for those of you uh, who may be familiar, right off the bat when I say that, you know that's like the chapter of love where it talks about love. Very well known by so many. Read at weddings. People post it and share it all the time. And, you know, unfortunately it's lived less than it's shared, you know. So, um... If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I did not express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than the tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. It is the only thing we will take with us into eternity. Faith and hope will one day cease. Words of knowledge, prophecy, they will one day cease. But love, the attribute of God, who God is, it's not just an attribute, it's who he is. That is what we will take with us. I think, you know, we all know that so well. And the reason I like to read it sometimes in this translation is because it's so, it's a little different from what we're used to hearing that it causes you to think and be like, ooh, I never thought of it like that before. Instead of you reading something you've always read and you kind of, your mind kind of shuts down. You know, you're not really paying attention. We've all, a lot of us in this room, we're all intimacy people. And what I mean by that is we all know that a relationship with Jesus Christ is extremely important. We're all the type of people, like, I love my prayer closet. I love my alone time. 
I feel the need for it. Some, not as much, but for me, I feel the need. And we see people out there who are, you know, so passionately in love with Jesus and they're very powerful ministers and a lot of us follow them. And there's this thing like, oh, in order for me to become like them, I need to sit in my closet three hours a day and, you know, I need to, and it turns into this thought process without us, it's a well-meaning thing. Without us realizing it turns into a striving. Oh, in order for God to move in my life like their life, I need to do what they're doing, and I need to sit in my closet for five, six, seven, eight hours a day. And I'm here to tell you that that is not what you need to do. That is not all a relationship is. I'll, for example, me and Mike, we're married. Our relationship is not always me and him in the bedroom. Okay? Like, we're all adults here. That's not what it is. It's not us just snuggling and being together alone. It's living life. Him at work, me at work, we're out, we're together. Sometimes we're, you know, playing. Sometimes we're in moments like this. That's life with Jesus too. There has to be a balance. And I like to call it, um, I don't know how this came about, but there's the secret place and then there's the abiding place. The place where we live with Jesus. Secret places like, you know, you got your little snuggle time, you got your date night, you know, hopefully you can do it every day, every night, but sometimes you can't. And there's no guilt or shame about it because you're living life with Jesus and we need to learn to abide in him. Abide in him. I want, I want to just freeze there for a second because the identity message has become too focused on Christ living in me. Mm -hmm. It's a package deal. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a package mm -hmm. deal. But there is no Christ living in me if I'm not abiding in him. Mm -hmm. There, that is where it all is. Who are we in Christ? Not who's Christ in me. Who am I in Christ? Where am I in Christ? This isn't about me, about who I am, about how saved I am, about how clean I am, about who I'm called to be. This is about me living in Christ, me abiding in Christ, me being one in Christ. From there comes forth my nature and my identity. From there, not from him and me. Because without that foundation, it can become very selfish and self-righteous. And based on what we're reading here, there's not a lot of self going on when it comes to the spirit, right? Now, with that being said, there are matters of respect. We are not to let people step on us. I am the first one to tell you that, right? You, people, you need to ensure people are respecting you because God loves you. But we're not touching that subject right now. Now what, what I'm talking about is letting go of ourself and in everything that we do, even when we have to ensure others are respecting us, it has to be done in love. It has to be done in gentleness. It has to be done in kindness. There's a right way and a wrong way to exhort and to bring someone into knowing that maybe they're in the wrong. And sometimes by us wanting to let someone know they're wrong, we wound up being wrong because we're not following it according to God's heart. That's why it's important to abide in Christ because when we do, we'll know how he would handle the situation. So... We read all of that, and now I'm getting to the meat and potatoes. <laughs> so that was all to bring us yes, into, um, <laughs> in John 14, 15, 16, and part of 17. If I had to, if I, if someone were to take my Bible away and give me, say like you get to pick a few pages, give me those pages, because it's red letters all over the place. And it's kind of like the 
what Jesus, Jesus' last words to his disciples. He had just a little bit of time with them, and he's like, I gotta, if there's something I need them to know before I go, it's this. 